Paul, I used to call him Pablo. And one of the things I noticed about him, truly a humble young man. As a matter of fact, the kind of person I would have loved to have seen go into the ministry, the gospel ministry. And he's still quite young and so it's not too late, but thank you so much, Paul. Also want to say thanks to, to Gordon and, and Millie. Our good friends, and um, I had the, I had the chance of meeting them in the states. Mandy's good friends, of course, and um, two very wonderful, spiritual, nice young people. And we're so happy that they've done a great job this morning. Like the the energy that they've brought to the program. I want to say thanks to Beverly. Beverly is, is has always been a tremendous singer, very sweet singer. And it's good to see that God is still using her to demonstrate um, her giftedness in singing. Thank you so much, Victoria, for this opportunity to minister. And I, you know, Victoria is, is, is a church of character. I, 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 I am always conscious, or I was when I was there, um, I served twice up there under Pastor Mingo, first of all, as an intern. Pastor Dennis Mingo, tremendous man of God, tremendous preacher and administrator and a very likable person. And then I served after that, I think in 2005, uh, for about two years. And I had a great time at Victoria. It's a, it's a church that has a passion for souls. And that is, you know, you, you just say, you say souls and they're ready to run and to preach the gospel. It's also a church that that has some very strong individuals. I think of the Gillises and I think of Hunter. I think of, um, I think of, 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 of the, 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 the Monfords and, um, but somehow I think of Dr. Karen Cummins and so many others. But somehow even with, even with the existence of so many strong individuals, things are working well at Victoria. 70th, 70th anniversary is a, is a tremendous time, beloved. And of course, because of time, I'm going to be very short in saying this um, because I want to just get to the, what I want to share with you. But apart from being a time of celebration, it is also a time of, of reconsecration, a time of recommitment, a time when all of us, by the grace of God, should seek to be drawn closer to Jesus Christ. It's not a time for playing church. It's not a time simply to, to have fellowship with brethren. It is a time above everything else to be drawn closer to God so that we can take his word and preach it and go into all the world and tell others about the beauty and goodness of God. And so this morning, I want to just talk to us for a, hopefully a brief moment on the topic, never the same again. Let's bow our heads and as after we bow our heads, I will read, read parts of the text once more and then share with you what God has laid in my heart. Oh loving father, no man is worthy to talk about you to other men and women. But Father, we are grateful this morning that when you call us to minister, you always empower us. You equip us to carry out the task that you have assigned to us. And so this morning, dear God, break me and humble me afresh. Crucify self. Dethrone self and pride. Fill me and fill all of us, Lord, with your Holy Spirit once more. Bind Satan and his demons and cast them away from us. And, oh, loving Father, minister to all of us through your sacred, precious word. And, Father, as the title of the sermon, may our lives never be the same again. Thank you for hearing us in Jesus' holy and precious name. Let everyone say, 
Amen. Never the same again. And I just invite us to read again. It was well read before. But I just want to go back for a short moment to Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1, to verse, uh, verse 3 for now. The Bible says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up and his train, his glory that is, filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain or with two, he covered his face, in reverence that is, and with two he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another, and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. His glory cannot be hidden. And let's, let's go on a little bit. And the post of the door moved. And the voice of him that cried and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, this is Isaiah speaking, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, <clears throat> and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes, mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongues from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. And he said, well, let's, let's stop there for now. Never the same again. The very first verse in the passage that we have just read gives us an indication when it says that in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord. It gives us an indication that young prophet Isaiah had an unforgettable experience that happened in the very year when King Uzziah died. Bible scholars tell us that the death of Uzziah took place around 740 to 739 BC. Remember you're counting down, 740, 739, 738. Around 740, 739 BC, this great king Uzziah died. And so something, something uh, uh, unforgettable and awesome happened to prophet Isaiah. We are told that Isaiah had gone to the temple. Ellen White said that he had gone there to pray. Because he was not a priest, he was not in the inner part of the temple. He was more in what you call the, the outer court or the, or the portico. But as his mind was, was in somewhat of a turmoil, because the year when King Uzziah died, the warmongering king of Assyria, Tiglat, Pilisar the third by name was on the rampage. He was destroying kingdoms and nations left, right, and the center. And only Uzziah was able to stand up to the might of this, of this warmongering Assyrian king. Because Uzziah himself was a warrior. 
But now, the hope of all the nations, the, the hope of Judah was dead. So who is going to stand up against this rampaging king, Tiglath Pileser? Isaiah is concerned. Isaiah is distressed. It is a time of peril and crisis. And so he goes into the temple and he seems to be asking God in his mind, Lord, how could you be so off in your timing? How could you allow the, the only man who is standing against this king to die at this crucial time, this time of peril? And then the Bible says that God shows up and, and Isaiah looks and he sees God high on the throne. Beloved, I want, to, I want to quickly make three simple points to us, sir. Allow us to gleam, invite us to gleam three simple lessons from this awesome story. One, Isaiah looked higher. Number two, Isaiah was led by God to look deeper, looked at himself. And number three, Isaiah looked wider and farther. So first, he looked higher. The Bible says that Isaiah saw God. God gave Isaiah a vision of himself. And in seeing God, he saw, he saw the glorious God, the king, on his throne. You get the distinct impression that God is saying to Isaiah, Isaiah, it's time to stop looking so low. You've been looking too long at men, looking too long at the earthly king Uzziah. You've been idolizing Isaiah, um, King Uzziah, but it's now the time to realize that the real king is not dead. He is very much alive and well. And so Isaiah, look higher. Look at me. I am the real king. Uzziah is gone. But the real king is still here. What is amazing is that as Isaiah looked higher, he heard the, the seraphims and, 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 and saying, holy, holy, holy. One gets the distinct impression that their greatest joy and, and privilege was to praise God for his holiness. Oh, they seem to be worshiping and adoring God 24-7. Their minds were not fixed on themselves. Their minds were firmly fixed on God, a holy God, a God of impeccable righteousness. And the scholars all tell us, by the way, some scholars suggest to us that the fact that they said holy, holy, holy might have been that they were referring to the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But, but other scholars suggest to us that even more, they were referring to the perfection of God's holiness. In him there is no sin, no unrighteousness, no stain of evil. God is perfectly holy. So Isaiah looked higher and he looked at God. Beloved, I want to remind us today and during this week as we celebrate the 70th anniversary of the glorious church at, 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 at Victoria, that we would remember that God is alive and well and he is still on his throne. The second lesson, as I, as I looked higher, and he saw the holiness of God. He looked deeper and saw his own sinfulness. Oh, the Bible tells us that, that two men went in the book of, of the book of Luke 18, verse 9 to 14. Tells us a story of two men who went up into the temple to pray, a Pharisee and a publican. Oh, the Pharisee looked at himself and, and, and he praised himself for all his greatness and his holiness and his tight paying and his, and his Sabbath keeping and all, and all those things are good things. And he forgot one thing. He forgot to talk about God. He seemed to think that his righteousness came from, from himself. 
forgetting that his righteousness was but a reflection, a gift of God's grace. Ah, but the publican, the publican would not even raise up his head. But the Bible says that the publican cried, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Beloved, when Isaiah saw God's holiness, he also became conscious of his own sinfulness. God have mercy on the Christian who is always preoccupied, and I'm talking to myself as well, preoccupied with others and, and, and who thinks that he is, he is holier than thou, that he is God's gift to men. Sure, God wants us, to, wants, us, wants us to have an assurance of our salvation, but we must ever remember that were it not for the grace of God, we would have absolutely nothing. The Pharisee said, I am, I, am, I am the best. Look at me. I am the man. No one can be as righteous as I am. And the poor publican, the poor tax collector said, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And the Bible says that Jesus says that one, he went to be justified. Oh, he was declared righteous. Oh, declared righteous because of the, he had held on to the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Isaiah saw God when he looked higher. And he was led to look deeper into himself and look at the fact that God was holy, but he himself was spiritually improvident. But I am grateful that God does not leave us in a place of sin. Oh, beloved, I don't know what is happening in your heart this morning. I don't know, maybe, maybe you did something that you should not have done five minutes ago or even a minute ago. But there is hope for the sinner. For the grace of God is all powerful and inexhaustible. God, God reached out. His grace is truly magnificent. It's wide and high. And, 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 and so God, God's grace laid hold of Isaiah. For the Bible says that, that an angel took an, a, 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 a coal and placed the coal on Isaiah's on Isaiah's unclean lips. And made him clean. Beloved. This holy God. Wants us. To be like he is. He is not a moving away. From sinners. He is moving towards sinners. His heart overflows with love. And just like he did with Isaiah. Just like he did with the publican. God can touch us. And make us clean. By the blood of Jesus Christ today. And this brings me to my third point. The third lesson. As Isaiah. Now cleansed. By God. He looks. He looks wider. He looks farther. And he hears God saying to him. Isaiah. Now that I have made you fit. Now that I have made you clean. Who will go. To preach the word for us. And Isaiah says, with a joy in his heart and with, with, with Christian humility, Isaiah says, I will go. Isaiah looked wider and he saw the hungering hearts all over the world. In Judah, he saw people who were longing to know Jesus Christ. Beloved, if you and I really want to celebrate Victoria and celebrate the goodness of God, we can never be silent when people are dying in their sins. Oh, if, if we know this, if we have this medicine that can cure the COVID of sin, the blood of Jesus, if we have this, this is medicine that can heal broken hearts, that can heal troubled marriages, that can heal sex, sex addiction and drug addiction, and that can change people from, from being gossipers and into, or, or gossips into preachers. Oh, beloved, if we know Christ, truly know Christ, if we've had an encounter with Jesus and our lives are never the same again, we cannot Remain silent. 
And so Isaiah answered the call. And he said, I will go. In other words, beloved, the life of Isaiah was never the same again. Just one look of the king of kings at the holy one, the righteous one, at the God of grace and, and mercy. Isaiah was changed forever. And his life was never the same again. Beloved, how are things with us? There is a God who loves us so much, but a God who hates our sins. And a God who wants to separate the sinner from his sins. Oh, what do I mean? A God who wants us to grow and grow and grow. And become more and more like Christ. Can I remind us quickly. That one day when we get to heaven. We will not see Judas. But how could this be? Judas once walked with Christ. Ate from the same pot. Slept under the same roof. But when you get to heaven. You will not see Judas. Because you see beloved. Judas fell into sin. And he fell hard. But oh, Judas fell into sin, but he refused to get up, refused to rise, refused to call upon Jesus in repentance, refused to, con to confess his sins. He remained in his sins. He did not repent. He did not grow. And so Judas will not be in heaven. Ah, but one day when you get to heaven and you call for a man called Peter, Peter, like Judas ate from the same pot with Jesus. Slept under the same roof. But Ju Peter also fell and fell hard. He said, I don't even know this Christ. He cursed and said, I don't know Jesus. He fell and fell hard. But ah, by the grace of God, as Jesus looked at him, Peter realized something. That yes, there was disappointment in Jesus' eyes. But more than that, there was mercy and grace that in the eyes of Jesus, he heard Jesus say to him, Peter, I know that you have messed up big time, but I still love you and I offer you my forgiveness. And oh, the forgiveness of God, beloved, it guides us to, to, to respond in repentance. For repentance does not cause God to forgive. It is his offer of forgiveness that leads us to repentance. And so Peter repented. And so one day when you get to heaven and you, and you, you pick up the megaphone, as it were, of the universe, if, if you please, and you call, you call Peter's name, Peter will answer, here am I, I'm present. Why? Because Peter fell. But by the grace of God, he got up. He repented. And he grew and he grew and grew to become more and more like Jesus Christ. Beloved, that's what God wants from us this morning. Isaiah did not stay the same way. He left the temple. A brand new man, never the same again. And everywhere he went, he said to them, I met God. I met Jesus. But let me tell you something, beloved. If you go to John 12, verse 41, John chapter 12, verse 41, the Bible tells us that the member of the Godhead that Isaiah saw was Jesus. Oh, he saw Jesus. He saw Jesus. His mind, his life was now filled with Jesus everywhere he went. Everyone who asked him, Isaiah, you look different. What happened to you? All he had to say, I saw Jesus. Have you seen Jesus? And can people tell that you have seen Jesus? I worked in a district long ago. And I, I was one day out doing some visitation. And so the elders took me to a, to, this is not the East, East Coast, by the way. It's not, has nothing to do with Victoria and those churches. And the, the elder said to me, um, Pastor, we'd like you to go and visit this young man. 
So we went into a small house, you know, humble, humble place of abode. We saw a young man lying on a bed. He was totally emaciated. He was, he was very thin, tall, but extremely thin. You could see that he was, he was stricken by HIV AIDS. And so as we, as we looked at the, the young man and then we anointed him and we prayed for him, his, uh, he was there and, and um, his young wife was not too far away from him. We anointed him and then we left the home. When we left the home, one of the elders said to me, said, said Pastor LaFleur, do you know, and I'm not trying to be facetious, I'm not trying to be, to be jocular, I am not casting a aspersion on, on anyone who might have been stricken with AIDS or anyone who is, who is struggling with sexual identity. That is not my desire this morning. But the, the elder said to me, Pastor, that man that we just anointed was once a girl. I, I said, what? What do you say? He said, yes, he was once a girl. He dressed like a woman. He wore dresses. He had his hair long. He had lots of makeup on his face. He was gay. He was a homosexual. So I listened to the story. But thank God, the elder went on to say that one day, this man who they claim was once a girl heard a preacher talk about the grace and power of God. He heard a preacher say that there's power in the blood and that Jesus is mighty to save. And this man who they say was once a girl got baptized, of course, gave his heart to Jesus, got baptized, became a faithful member of a, of a Seventh-day Adventist church. And his life was never the same again because he met Jesus and he who was once a girl became a real man. Let me tell you something, beloved. There is nothing that God can't do. Well, the story has a sad ending. However, nevertheless, the young man became stricken with HIV AIDS and he died. But before he died, he wanted to get married. And the girls in the area who knew his past, you know, did not want to get married to him, of course. So he went into the interior and he found a beautiful girl. Apparently he told her about this, that, you know, um, well, as a matter of fact, at that time, he did not know he was HIV. He was positive. Discovered it later on. Got married to this beautiful girl. To make a long story short, he died. I left that district, but before I left the district, the girl had had three tests done on her. And by the grace of God, the results came up negative. God is a good God. Oh, beloved, there is nothing that God can't do. If God can change Isaiah, he can change you and me. If God can change the public and the temple, he can change you and me. If God can turn a, a, a man from being a homosexual into being a real man, then Jesus can do it one more time. And if you and I meet this Jesus today, our lives will never be the same again. Let me, let me as I begin to prepare to stop, time is going. I just want to read a powerful verse. First John 1, 8 and 9. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Ah, but if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But I ask you the question, how could that be? What about Osama bin Laden? Suppose Osama bin Laden had come to Christ and said with sincerity, Lord, I have sinned. I have killed thousands of people. Forgive me. And he really meant it. Would it have been fair? 
would it have been fair for God to forgive Osama bin Laden? Ah, oh, beloved, it is not about fairness. It is about the grace of God. Because you see, God can forgive because someone has paid the price for our sins, for your sins and my sins. Someone has paid the price. And that person is Jesus Christ. Oh, any sinner can be forgiven because Jesus has paid the price. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Beloved, I want to give us one minute, one minute to talk to God individually. One minute. And then after that minute, even though I cannot see you, if you really desire that your life should never be the same again, then I want you to raise your hand for God will see you. But even before you raise your hand, let us pray for a minute silently, talking to God about ourselves, for cleansing, to be washed afresh in the blood of the Lamb, to change us, that our life shall never be the same again. And then let us raise our hands in recommitment to Jesus Christ. Then I will pray for all of us. Our loving God and Father, we are so grateful for the blood of the Lamb. Oh, Father, just as you did to Isaiah, you changed him so radically when you gave him an encounter with Jesus Christ. Oh, Father, just as you did with, with the, the publican, just as you did with the young man who was stricken with AIDS, when they had encounters with Christ. Father, I know that you have done it with me. We know that so many of us, that you have done it with us. It's not about us. It's about the righteousness of Christ. And so today, like you have said, we confess and repent of our sins. We reach out there, God, and accept the righteousness of Christ, the forgiveness of God, the righteousness of Christ. Oh, we, we did this robe that clothes us, that when the Father sees us, he sees Christ's righteousness. And he looks upon us as if we had never sinned. Oh, loving Father, please forgive us. Please wash us. Please cleanse us. And may our lives never be the same again. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Amen.